Hello, how are you today? My name is Shamel and I am your host for Genealogy Quick Start. Have you been doing research? We hope so. Have you been checking out the people around your ancestors? Uh-oh. We're going to show you why that is extremely important to do with our first quick start today, which is who were your ancestors' paper neighbors? Also, we have a very special guest today, Claire Keenan, and she is going to help you to find clues to your Irish past. Now, I know Irish is probably like, you know, one of the top ethnicities here. So I know that she's going to help so many of you out there to find your Irish. Maybe she might even be able to help some of you guys who have that 2% Irish that we've been getting in our DNA. I don't know about that, but maybe we'll see. How's it going? Do you watch us on YouTube, Facebook? Guess what? You can also watch us on Philly Cam. All of you who have joined us so far, you know we like to know who you are, where you are. And of course, if you're with a genealogy group, please let us know your group because there might be a soul out here that needs to be saved genealogically. So we have so much here for you today. Let's go ahead and get started with genealogy quick start first up we have my buddy michael john neal of genealogy tip of the day how are you michael oh, i'm pretty good Shamel. how are you i am good and we are missing my buddy jim Bidler. But not really, because he is taking in the audience experience today. So no heckling today, Jim. No heckling. No virtual doing, tomatoes either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Jersey tomatoes haven't come out yet, so he can't throw those. <laughs> How you doing, Michael? I'm not too bad. I'm in Virginia Beach today, which isn't super far. Not as far from you as I usually am. But Yes, uh, you're closer. We should have had a meetup in the middle. We should have. I don't know where the middle would be. I, know I, it's not I, Delaware. I don't either. All I know is these states on the East Coast, I, they're always small as far as I'm concerned. What's um, with you guys? It's so funny. The people who live in the center, like they're laughing at our states like we're some big amalgam. We have character. Our states I, have character. That's why they're shapely. And you're property is all described in meets and bounds which is a whole well, other issue sucks. altogether <laughs> well that definitely sucks yes land descriptions suck up here <laughs> so michael let's talk about your quick start today i have never ever heard of this term have did you make up this term yes i just made I, seriously i just made it up i don't even remember it's been I a while since it. i made it up but the i quick just start today uh, is who were your ancestors paper neighbors what are paper neighbors michael well when your ancestor lives in a paper mache home it's who lives <laughs> next door no it's um in in any you know all document most documents that we use were created on paper and who appears next to your ancestor in those official records on the page before the page after if each record is a page who appears in the lines before the lines after if each entry is one individual line sometimes there's clues to that positional aspect in a document sometimes there's not it just it just it can be a random person who walks in next or whatever but especially if we're really stuck and we're kind of like in that sense we're grasping for clues looking who came into the courthouse on the same day as our ancestor mm. and things like that are things that we should think about we often think of who's next to our ancestor in the census yes um, that you know we were had that ingrained a lot of us have had that ingrained in us but the census is not the only document or record where sequential people could be a clue um, about the person we're actually stuck on so that's what we're going to be looking at in this quick start is the whose neighbors on paper all like right that sounds exciting let's see who we have with us here today angela allen is trying to be number one now it looks like she might be number one like multiple weeks in a row hello angela from houston hello lajoy from central maryland augs hey bursley from rockford illinois 
Hi, Denise from the Netherlands. Hello, Susan from Reading, PA. Hello, um, Sarah from Belleville, Texas. Why does Belleville sound so familiar? Hello, Mary Todd Allen from North Carolina. I can't wait to get to North Carolina. Hello, Jim Bidler. Jim, you didn't put where you're from. He didn't. Hey, you're, we're not talking to Jim until he puts where he's from. Hello, Paula <laughs> Moen from West Defford. How are you? Hi, Maureen from Pennsylvania, a square state. But you have some character by New Jersey, right? New Jersey pulled the character out of you. You know, that's why you have all that curvy stuff by us. Hello, um, Gwen from San Diego County, um, volunteering at the North San Diego County Genealogical uh, society. So everyone go check out Gwen if you're in San Diego. Hey, Wayne and Grace Ann with the Camden County Historical Society. Yay, let's rep it. Hey, Paul um, Shop, also from the Camden County Historical Society. And we couldn't get started until Quint got here from Cleveland, Ohio. Hi, Quint. And Wanda Looney from Birmingham, Alabama. And Blue Chip, Julie from San Diego <laughs> and hey Dean from AAGG in Philly. Nice to have everyone here. So Michael, are you ready to talk about these paper ancestors? I'm going to have to be ready. So we're good to go. There's... <laughs> Step one <laughs> is to choose a record. So um, what types of records are we going to cover here when you're talking about paper ancestors? Is this all the records or just specific any, records? Any record. Of course, some records that we'll see are more likely to have these paper neighbor clues than others. We're not really going to look at the census today, not because those neighborly clues aren't important, but because we get that we get told that so many other times. We're going to look at a, some naturalization records. We got a marriage record and there's one other uh, document in this in the discussion that we're going to look at today and then we'll talk about some general concepts as as well okay and so um step two is determine how the records are organized so how does this help with paper neighbors well it it helps us to determine if somebody in an adjacent record could be a clue or not be a clue um, if you know if we're looking at we want to look at how records get in the record book or whatever source we're using. If it's land deeds, it's the order in which they're brought into the courthouse. Um, if it's naturalizations, it's the order in which those individuals came to be naturalized at the courthouse. If it's death records, it's a, it's not the necessarily the order in which people died. It's the order in which the death certificates were recorded. In some places, they will be put in order of date of death. In others, they'll be recorded in the order in which they were brought in to be recorded. Uh, but you want to know how they get in the records because with this paper neighbor concept and in analyzing any record in general, how the records were created and organized helps you to understand and interpret them correctly. So it's, it's always a good thing to be thinking about. Yeah, that's kind of like the first thing I think of as soon as I look at it. So that mostly I'm trying to get to my record quickly, right? right. So you try to figure and out how it's organized. And that's on top of what is this? The problem with getting things online from an index, we find an online index and family search or ancestry by the magic of indexing, using that word loosely, <laughs> uh, pops a record up in front of us. Do we? Do, do you know what it is? Uh, sometimes that that's that's an important thing to be aware of too is what it is we're looking at but organization helps us for our concept today that we're talking about love it so next step step three after we've kind of looked at the records and understand how they're organized is to then look at the paper neighbors so you have some pretty interesting ones here is there one you wanted to show first or just show you just whatever? pull up whichever one you got and we'll talk about it um, <laughs> right. the thing to remember while Shamel's pulling this up whenever you find somebody in a record look at the pages before and the pages after one to make sure you've got the entire record two in, in some situations they might have been filing multiple documents on the same day and the index for whatever reason might have just taken you to one of those and not the others in that series. So there are several reasons for making certain you look at the ones before and the ones 
uh, after. Not the whole book necessarily, but some a few before and a few after. So just pull up whichever you want, Shamel. It's easier, and we'll we'll talk about that one. What is this? It's, well, this one is in English. If you can't read this, you need to have your, your uh, glass prescription. Check. No, this one's in, this one's in this one's in German script, and it's the I think this the second entry is for my triple great grandparents, and not that I expect anybody to be able to read this, but I I found it. It was in German. It took me a while to read it, and the the two boxes, the bottom line, I highlighted those because they're the exact the occupations are listed in different order for these are the names of the parents of one of the couple uh, individuals getting married but it's a, it's the exact same set of parents and the set the second entry was my triple great grandparents and sometimes when the records are not in the language you're used to it can be easy to overlook yes yes because you're, you're struggling especially if your uh, ability to read the script is not well developed yet you are struggling with every word and by the time you get to that next entry, you've forgotten what was above it or whatever. But um, it turns out they're married on the same day. I had to cut that off. This was already small enough. But they got married on the same day. The, it's, a, it's a female and her brother are getting married on the same day. Um, and it was pretty clear when I looked at the names of the parents. I had siblings, um, <clears throat> siblings getting married there on the yes, they were marrying they were marrying mm. first cousins we're not going to have that discussion today <laughs> Brother, first cousins. Uh, but you want to yeah you know, it doesn't happen very often but once in a while you know look at some other couples maybe they got married on the same date as your ancestor there's a potential they're totally and most likely totally unrelated but there's a potential that it was a friend or an associate someone they knew um, and two couples that were friends of each other decided on whatever date let's all four of us are going to get married um no i love that together, i think know, so i i've people. had that with some marriage records myself before um in florida same same day you know they were right next to each other thanks for reminding me of that um we have another one here um this one is interesting i'm not can you explain exactly how the um, blm track books are organized very briefly, these are the, the BLM track books, which I think is the next image you're going to pull up. This is part of it. That This is not the whole, it's a, a ledger. There's a left page and a right page to these entries. These track books are where when individuals would file land claims in areas where there was federal land uh, being dispersed in a variety of ways, the Bureau of Land Management would keep track of who had started a claim to a certain piece of federal property and was whether that claim was finished or still in in process these are organized geographically based on where the property is located so this is a, a page of that for a couple of sections if you're familiar with how big a section is that 600 640 acre square in um Nebraska, the county is eluding me right now, but it's th these. This page has entries for only about 1,240 acres, a couple of sections. It's so that more than one person would not file a claim to the same piece of property at the same time, and so they would not allow claims to property that had already been uh, completed to a claim and somebody had, had acquired it. It was just, it was to keep track of that, but it's organized geographically. And the very top dude there that you see, John H. Ufkus, that's my double great grandpa. Mm -hmm. And the the ones, the column in red was the date the claim was filed. And I found him. It took me a little while to find him. And his claim was canceled because he left it, went back to Illinois. But when I looked at the other people on that page, I noticed, and there's a blur on it in, in the image where I got it. But it, when you look, when you enhance it, it it's the same date. There were two other dudes, uh, Martin Heinrichs and Jasper <laughs> Baden. There were two other dudes that went to the land office, and the land office was a trip. It was not like a one-mile walk up the road to the land office. It was right. a 30-mile trip. But these three dudes in 1872 On are the same day. Same day. And keep in mind, they're paper neighbors in a couple ways. They're paper neighbors 
in this case, which means their claims are very near each other within a mm -hmm. mile, half a mile or a quarter mile of each other. So they're all filing claims to land in the same area on the same day. They, they rode to, together. I think they, they rode had, together. Right. <laughs> they had to know each other. Otherwise, it's a huge coincidence. Um, their claims were also all canceled on the same day, which doesn't really mean anything about them. Cancellation was if you had done nothing to, to prove up the claim, then there was a cancellation process. Okay. And a bunch of these were all canceled on the same day. It wasn't just these three dudes. It was a bunch of people that had their claims all canceled because new people wanted to file claims right. and the claims had been abandoned. But there were actually two other people on the next page. It wasn't just these three dudes. There were two others on the next page. I didn't pull an image for that, that also filed claims on September 4th, 1872. So the really neat thing was this told me these five guys had all gone out to Nebraska, settled and initially tried to settle because the claims were all canceled in the same area on the same day. So they had all traveled out there together, which, you know, that story, you had to kind of pull that out. It's like a lot of things. You have to pull things out of the records. So those dates allowed me to pull that story that those one guy stayed before apparently all abandoned their claims. Uh, guys in their late 20s or early 30s, if memory, if memory serves. OK, let's see. Was there were they all in the service or something? Is there they were there... all no, they were all immigrants from the same area and they had originally settled in one general area in uh, central Illinois. And I'm assuming they all got a burr in their be in their bonnet or whatever they didn't wear a bonnet but whatever um, <laughs> they got a hornet in their hat to all go out to, to nebraska and and homestead but four of them did did come back but one of them stayed okay what do we have here this is an 1858 naturalization and i just pulled this as an example and i made an interesting discovery that we'll see before we before we get done. But when I find a naturalization record or a declaration of intent, both are, are documents that appear in the, in the citizenship process. I look to see if there were other individuals, normally it's men, we're not going to have that discussion today. If there were other men that naturalized or uh, filed a uh, declaration of intent on the same date, it could mean they knew each other. It could mean they're in have some association biological or, or via marriage or whatnot uh, the records of course are not going to say that but it, sometimes it can, if you're really stuck if you're really stuck uh, this is a, an approach you might want to take um, did you, and so this was the one this was the first guy that naturalized on october 12th of 1858 in Hancock, yeah, that seemed like that was a crazy day so why it was so a crazy you, day do you have the okay so I was just looking to see initially when I was doing this for the quick start, um, I looked and I still have my paper notes right here. <laughs> I, did yesterday I was really well prepared and I went and looked and most of them were either from Prussia or Austria or other areas of Germany, all 20, 22 of them. The and Germans again. It, it was it was a bunch of Germans and looking at some of the names and being familiar with some of the last names, they were Germans from two different parts of the county. So they were a bunch of guys going going together. But 22 was a lot for one day, given this is a, a, a very rural area. And so I was curious. And so I went and I went through naturalizations for 1858 and 1859 to see how, what days they were naturalized on and how many each day. And as it says on the PowerPoint, the naturalizations occurred in chunks. They were in March, May, June, and they were in October. And it wasn't all through March, all through May, June, all through October. It was about a two week time period within each month every time. And so what that told me, and this is speculation, at this point, they were terms of the court. If you remember, mm -hmm. court was not always in session every right. day like or every week like it might be today. Right. Those are the terms of the court. Now, I should check that, uh, which I haven't yet because I did this so far in advance. Um, <laughs> I should check that with court records to see if, if that's true or not. But that, that's my suspicion as to what that is. When I looked at the other days from 1858 all the way through 1859, 
with the exception October 4th of that same year, there were 10 dudes that went and became naturalized. On all the other days, and there were 24 other days that men became naturalized in that two-year time period, at most four, often it was one oh, or two. Oh, wow. Uh, at most four, often it was one or two. So 10 on one day is, a, is an outlier, as we would yeah. call it, statistical sense. And 24 is just like way Ooh, beyond yeah. what we would expect. And so that got me thinking, what was going You always want to ask why. Remember in genealogy, you want to pretend you are a three-year-old child sometimes. <laughs> Not Some of us don't need to pretend. That does not mean you have a tantrum at the courthouse, but it means you ask, you want to ask why? You want to ask why? And so I know a decent amount about Illinois history, but a lot of dates and things are not right on the top of my head because the hair, there's no insulation, it goes away. So, but I did a Google search. 18, uh, what a, I knew it wasn't a presidential election year in 1858 because of the, you know, I knew that off the top of my head. I did a Google search. That was the year of the Lincoln Douglas debates. Wow. When they were running for um, Illinois state Senator and it was a huge deal. Um, it was well known throughout the state for a variety of reasons I learned about that. I won't go into, but my gut is telling me that they, there was that large increase because the election was in January of 1859, not in, not in November my gut tells me that's why there was a large influx of naturalizations in October of 1858 was because they wanted to vote in the election for Illinois Senate that following January. Wow. Um, you know, that, 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 you know, is it correlate? We're not going to have a, a discussion about correlation and causation and all those kinds of things, but my gut would seem to indicate that that is why there was that large influx of naturalizations. Uh, I also thought it was interesting to note that there were no no Irish, no English speakers that naturalized in that big bunch of those individuals as well. Uh, the one thing I want to do to follow up is to see if there's any newspaper mention of all these immigrants. Na since the number was so large. Yes, 22. I mean, I know in Chicago, 22 on one day is nothing, but that's not yeah. where we're at. Yeah. Um, to see if there's any mention in the newspaper of all these Germans, essentially, uh, at, of, in terms of ethnicity, coming to naturalize on that one on that one day. But that you know, and some of them were probably associates with each other, kind of looking at the looking at some of right. the names, some of that uh, already. Uh, but there, in this case, doing a Google search for that time period, since there were so many. Uh, gave me a little bit of a history, a reminder of what was of what was going on. And if that was one of my ancestors that naturalized, that would be a, a neat little thing for me, which really isn't about the quick start, but that would be a neat little <laughs> thing for me to add. He naturalized during that rush to, to, to be able to vote. He wanted to have his voice heard. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yes, I love that. So I think we moved on to step four is Probably. doing this analysis, right? You. Yeah try to figure out who they are, why they're there. You know, Michael, I always wanted to do census, like take a census record and track the census taker for, for my town. Um, it seems like a lot of work, but have you ever tried to do that? I have I have tried that. The, the additional challenge for me is I have no urban people that have street addresses in the census. Oh. Uh, and, and I don't, if I'm going to go to that much work, it's going to be on my people, not someone else's. Yeah. I mean, that, 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 that may sound selfish, but you know, it, it's, I'm not going to go to that much work on somebody else's people. It's going to have to be that much work is going to be on my people. But what I did was I took, uh, it's in progress. I took the uh, 1879, 1880 uh, real property tax list for one township, for one township. And I platted them out roughly. Um, and then the next step is to take, I, I have one reason for 1880 was there's an agricultural and it's my, I've got, again, I've got rural people. There's an agricultural census. And if they're, if they're in the agricultural census, they're probably, uh, so I've got a plat mass. So I've got landowners names. The, the farmers are more likely to be landowners. Tenant farmers could also be in that, in that 1880 agricultural census, but 
they're all going to be landowners in there too. That would help me get a rough outline for how the guy went through um, the township to kind of see what his general path was. But it it's a tedious, time-consuming process because you've got to somehow get a map. And if you don't figure out where everyone is and particularly in an, even in an urban area when there's not street addresses in the census, because I made the joke, they have them, but early enough, they don't, they don't they, always. Yeah. Right. Right. Then you've got it. You'd have to use city directories, which isn't ideal either to try to kind of map out those addresses and then put the census kind of on top of that, so to speak. It's the reason more people don't do it is it's a tedious it's a great concept and it sounds it great is. in theory, but it's a tedious, it's a tedious process to put that together because you want it for your people, not for somebody else's, but for your, <laughs> for your place. And, and so unless you've got somebody that has your place, that's done it, you're going to be doing it yourself. Unfortunately. This is true. Have any of you out there done that with the census, you know, track their census, their path, or have you examined your paper neighbors and came up with like some really interesting stuff? We definitely love to hear that. You know, the one thing about the census, we don't have an, an image of that, but you also want to keep in mind just because they're listed adjacently in the census does not mean they lived in adjacent properties or adjacent homes or across the street from each other or whatever. They might've been quite a distance. I mean, they're in the same township or enumeration district or what have you, but they might not have lived in as close a proximity as you might think for one reason or another. So let's see, Denise Payne says, thanks Michael for the connection with elections and naturalizations. My German families were in Freeport, Illinois where one of the Lincoln Douglas debates took place. We'll look to see if there was a run on naturalization in Stevenson County as well. Go Michael, you getting people to dig in those records deeper. You know, there's, Lynn there's, another... says, Oh, sorry. Go, no, go ahead. Go she ahead. said in uh, Chicago, they renamed and renumbered the street. I think there is a city directory somewhere that translates it. Yeah. That's not fun. Gwen. There's a, that was in a, I, I think that's around the late 19 aughts, if memory serves. And there, there on, there's an online guide to help you help you translate post change to the to the pre change, the pre change address. There's one other county, uh, which I have a personal interest, where I want to see if there was an influx of uh, naturalizations in light of the Lincoln Douglas debate. The other thing that I learned that has nothing to do with this that I thought was interesting when I was reading about the Lincoln Douglas debates was that was after a, a popular shorthand method had been developed and it made it easier for individuals to get accurate transcriptions of the speeches to have them published in newspapers. Oh, okay. Technology. <laughs> yeah. And we think of technology as being, you know, digital or whatever, but that was a an advancement, if you no, will. No, that's pretty advanced. Of, yeah, so you can get their own words. You get it in their own right. words. I love that. Let's go to step five, which is to document your findings. We always say that at the end. Write it up because you might forget it. And let's go through all the steps for locating who were your ancestors' paper neighbors. Step one, choose a record. Step two, determine how the records are organized. Step three, look at the paper neighbors. And step four, you want to analyze them. Step five, document your findings. So thank you so much, Michael. Yeah. If you guys have more questions for Michael, go ahead and put them into the comments. And when he comes back, we'll talk about it. So see you a little bit, Michael. See you a little bit. <laughs> All right. Let me start the second quick start. People are already saying, did I miss her? Did I miss her? No, you did not. Hold on a second. All right. Welcome back to the second quick start of Genealogy Quick Start. Today, we have a very special guest, Claire Keenan. Claire and I decided that we couldn't remember how long it's been since we've seen each other. So we decide not even to think about it. We just, you know, we see each other in our minds. But before we get to Claire and finding clues to your Irish past, we have a small segment for you, especially because, you know, it's always that time of year 
for family reunion planning. And when you're a family reunion, genealogists should all be a part of their family reunions. Let's just get that out there. But, and I'm encouraging you, if you don't, you can have a gathering to share your family history. But when you're doing reunions, things happen, right? And you always want to keep everything wonderful with your family. And so today we have a special segment called Sticky Reunion Situation. So I'm going to play a video for you from the Family Reunion Institute. Here we are. Welcome to the Family Reunion Institute Sticky Reunion Situations. This Sticky Reunion Situation is so shocking that I would need help to handle this professionally. We have professionals here today. Let's hear from Suzanne Vargas Holloman from the Family Reunion Institute. Hello, Suzanne. Hello, Shamel. Let's jump right into the situation and Suzanne is gonna provide the fix. The situation is, we provide college scholarship money to a family reunion, to a family member who decided they're not gonna to go to college after all. Should they return the money? Suzanne. <laughs> <laughs> I know, Shamel, do we even have to ask, right? They, they should know that they have not fulfilled what was agreed upon with the family. And so we're all aghast until it happens in our family. <laughs> we, we're like shocked and appalled that a family member would not return the funds. And um, so if that does happen, try to give the person a little bit of grace. You know, if they're, if they're somebody, a young person in their teens, maybe they thought the money was awarded to them and not for educational use. Or maybe they're going to take a gap year and they say, I'll use it next year. So try to have a little bit of understanding that it's probably not a case of ill will. They're trying to run with the family's money. Um, and then put together uh, an email, word it very gently, have another family member look at the email, make sure that it's neutral, send it to the family member, but then follow it up with a call and talk to the family member, let them know the situation, set a specific timeline of when you would like the money returned, how you would like it returned, where it should be returned, all of the specifics so they can't say, well, I didn't know where to send the money or I didn't know you wanted me to do it PayPal or whatever it would be so that they are really clear about returning the money. Now, if they don't return the money, then the question is, did you have them sign any kind of binding agreement? Did you give them terms and conditions? So when they applied for that scholarship, did they sign a paper with terms and conditions that said, if I do not pursue this education, then I am to return the money. Mm -hmm. Don't want to get to the point in any family situation where it becomes legalistic and <laughs> got to look for the lawyer in the family to help us out and all of that. Um, if it really becomes that difficult, you want to find another family member who will come in and help um, with the discussion and, you know, could be the individual's parents, maybe, maybe not, help with the discussion in terms of getting that money returned. It's sticky. What can we say? <laughs> the biz fixes like it's really you laid it out very well and it just feels less sticky so thank you so much for the wisdom of the family reunion institute thank you all right that was the sticky reunion situation hopefully you will never have this come up but if you do you now know how to handle it. So everyone's waiting for her. Let me bring her out. Claire, how are you today? I'm doing pretty good. How about you, Chamel? 
I'm good. I'm really happy to have you here today, and I'm really happy to reconnect with you. Um, Claire, yeah, it's always, been a long time. <laughs> we always ask our special guests to share their one minute genealogy story, how you got started, and how you knew you were hooked. Well, um, I was in school at the time. And uh, a friend of mine said, where are your, where's your family from in Ireland? And I felt very proud of myself that I was able to say, County Tyrone. And then she said to me, oh, me too. Where in County Tyrone? And I realized I had no idea. So um, she was going to Ireland to do some research. This was way long ago in the days uh, before internet <laughs> where you had to actually travel to look at the original records. So she came back and she said, here's your grandfather's birth certificate. And it wasn't the date I expected. Um, it wasn't really a location that meant anything to me. And the name was slightly different. Like the middle initial was different. Hmm. And I thought to myself, well, how do I know that she got the right John Keenan? I mean, it's a relatively common name. So within six months, I was on a trip to Ireland to redo the research <laughs> and was able to confirm that, yes, indeed, she had found the right person. <laughs> and so from there, I was looking into his family and his wife's family and trying to put them all together. And that's how I got started on the easy side of my family. That's my father's side because his parents both came from Ireland. Um, wow. And then once I had it, a little under my belt and was comfortable with it. Then I started researching my mother's side, which was the more difficult because she didn't know anything about her father's side of the family. And all she knew about her mother's side is that they'd been in the U.S. for a long time. So uh, at least oh, right. by my That's standards, a long time. <laughs> uh, they that came was over in like the 18, early 1830s. Wow, um, so, so it's a great way to get started doing research traveling to Ireland. <laughs> That's yes. pretty nice. So speaking of um, Ireland, everyone is waiting to hear your tips. So let's go ahead and get okay. started with a quick start for finding clues to your Irish past. So let's start with step one, which is to document what you know. So um, you want to talk about that? Oh, like what you would do? Sure. Um, you really start with what, what family stories you have, whether you've been able to prove any of it or not. Um, is there a family story about where in Ireland they came from or what kinds of things they experienced there that might help you narrow down a region or a time period. Um, and you can also look at um, do documents that you do, that you look at for any kind of research in the United States. You look at the census, you look at the birth, marriage, and death certificates, um, any one of which might have a clue uh, to where the family came. All right. uh, one thing that I find interesting with the um, with Irish, especially, is you may find in the immigrants' children's marriage records that they say where their parents came from in Ireland. And you're going to show us all of that with the record. So document yes. what you know is kind of just seeing what you have, right? And you have Gather this the evidence. Talk to the elders you know, see what information you have. If you've already started uh, with American research, and review everything one. you have and see where else you might need to look. So that's your step two is to yeah. locate U.S. records. 
So um, which record did you want me to share? The third in 1930 census? Sure. Okay. Let's share that. So what is so special um, okay. about this? I really not strongly enough. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Claire. There's okay. a slight the delay, but go ahead. <laughs> Talk to okay. us about what makes the um, 1930 census so special. Okay. In 1922, Ireland, uh, there was a civil war. Well, there was a, first a war for independence from Great Britain, then a civil war when the two halves couldn't agree on what the treaty should be. And that is when uh, the six counties in the province of Ulster were set aside as being Northern Ireland and the, re and the remaining 26 uh, counties were to be independent. Um, and there were a few stages it went through. Today, it's the Republic of Ireland, but they, they basically gradually um, unattached themselves from British rule. So, by the time of the 1930 census, it's the first, it's the first census uh, after the partition of Ireland. And second, so that means that it's the first that will tell you whether the people reported they or their parents were born in either the Irish Free State, which is what is now the Republic, or if they were born in Northern Ireland. And Sorry, I'm having a hard time seeing this screen. So you have Carlin, and um, he's showing father from Irish Free State and mother from Irish Free State, and James Keenan saying father is from Irish Free State and mother is from Northern North Ireland. Okay. Well, the first first point I'd like to make is this Keenan family is no relation to mine. It's just oh. a fairly common name. <laughs> um, but he says his father's from the Irish Free State and the mother's from the north of Ireland. So I tend to believe that's accurate. But if you look at the Carlins, both of them, they say both parents are from the Irish Free State. And in fact, both were from Northern Ireland. So what this tells me, um, and I know this because I've already done the research. So in retrospect, I know it's inaccurate. Um, when the treaty happened in 1922, some people were against it and some people were for it. And that's what caused the Civil War. And even after the Civil War was settled, a lot of people in the North still were Political activists, they didn't want to admit to being in or from Northern Ireland. They didn't want to give any um, recognition to the mm -hmm. establishment of a separate state. So mm -hmm. if people from the North tell you that they're from the South, that generally means that they were relatively politically active and they were resisting the change. Um, so the rule I've come up with based on my own research is if in the 1930 census, someone tells you they're from Northern Ireland, I tend to believe it. If they tell you there could not be true and you definitely need to keep your mind open about, you know, looking at all records to see if you can confirm or deny that because they may be sorry claire's thing is going in and out yeah, i don't know stance. for yours okay so claire you basically i believe you, your yeah. internet is going in and out but i basically believe what you just said is that if they say they're from the north pretty much believe them but if they say they're from the free state 
They could be, or they might be from the North, but they're just politically active and they're still standing up, you know, for free state. Correct. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's look at this next U.S. record of as a passenger manifest. Is that the, is that okay to show, Claire? Sure. Okay. So here we have this 1905 passenger manifest. Talk to us about this. Okay. Now, for a lot of people. Uh, this may be much too recent for them, but for those like me who have recent immigrants, um, the general rule of thumb is the more recent the passenger list, the more information is on it. And on this one, you can see where it's saying Daniel McCullough is not just from Ireland, but he's and speaks Irish, but that he's from the townland of Glen Roan. Mm. And in Irish research, the townland is the smallest possible administrative division. So it's as if someone has told you the exact neighborhood in a town mm. that something's from. Cool. Many of these are small rural communities of probably not even uh, large enough to count as a village. They're just a grouping of farms, maybe. So knowing the exact townland is like getting gold. You know, you've, you've just found the, the answer everyone is striving for. <laughs> Yay. Once you know that townland, then you can really delve into the records in Ireland. I love it. I love it. But you're saying, so I just, I love what you just said. You know, once you know that, then you can do Ireland, but you should not be rushing across the pond, right? Can you tell us why we should right. not be doing that? If all you know about your people is that they're from Ireland, you're, unless it's an extremely rare name, which few names in Ireland are, um, you almost never will be able to find out where they came from. And the main reason for that is there's been massive destruction of records in Ireland. Uh, in 1922, as part of the um, Civil War, one, one side uh, um, barricaded themselves in front of the public records office which is where all the censuses and birth, marriage, deaths and wills and all the things we genealogists love. That's where they are all stored. And the other side said, well, you're not going to hide there and think that you can get away from me that way. So, so they started bombing them and the bombs destroyed the public records office and the documents in it were seen floating down the river for 20 or more months. <laughs> floating through the air, you know, they've done the best they can to recreate what was missing, but there's uh, the vast majority of the records that were there at the time have never been recovered or substituted. They're working on a new effort right now dealing with the National Archives of England and Scotland and even the United States and Australia, anywhere that has a large Irish population. Irish population of, um, to see, you know, some of these places will have duplicates. If the person needed their birth certificate to prove something, or even as an identification in the new country, there may be a cache of records that were stored in Ireland but survive in copy form in these other country. countries. Sounds so good. there's so a big ongoing on. multi-year project to reconstruct whatever they can. That's great to know, Claire. Yes. Let's look at the other right. U.S. record that you suggest that people look at for Irish, trying to find their Irish past, which is step three, is to locate U.S. Find church records. Yes. Um, so let's show what you got here. Okay. This is from the Diocese of Elizabeth, New Jersey. And um, it's interesting to me because there's uh, multiples on the one page. 
Um, it's in church Latin, which if you haven't researched it before, is not necessarily Latin the way you may have studied it, but it's kind of, kind of sort of an approximation of Latin. Um, <laughs> this one is the marriage of Joan or Jane Nolan. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. John, I suppose that is. Nolan to Susanna Fox mm -hmm. and it says he is from Galway in Ireland and she is from New Jersey in the okay. United States. So if okay. you're researching the Nolan part, at least now you have a county to focus your efforts on. Yeah. And that's a much better thing than having 32 counties to be looked for. <laughs> uh, this next one, is uh can't read his name oh donagle is it don what's this yeah name? it's ann gallagher marrying james gallagher no sorry okay. yeah Anne she Flynn. is the daughter of i think claire froze james gallagher they are marrying uh, looks like John. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having a very different, diff That's okay. different I'm reading. The, my the, old the loco, the loco is where the, the, loco the important is. thing is that their location is reported as County Leitrim. So, again, that really narrows down your search for you. Um, yes, I this, love that. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, Me, and I'm for sorry. each of these, um, quite often you will find when you find the civil record of the marriage, it more than likely will just say Ireland. But if you then pursue the, the church, church record and they happen to be in a parish where there are lots of other Irish, maybe even the priests are Irish, mm -hmm. they're much more likely to record the county in Ireland at least that the that the bride and groom are from. So right. that, you know, never say to yourself, oh, I already know the date and place of marriage. I don't, I have the civil record. I don't know, need the church record. <laughs> you never know what you're going to find in one that's not in the other. Exactly. Especially, you know, you, you may find that some of the sponsors at a baptism um, turn out to be family members. And of course, Paper the, neighbors. Yeah, the birth record, the civil birth record is never going to tell you who's because that's even happening after the birth. So right. they'd have to be uh, great prognosticators to figure out who the sponsors were going to be. All right, let's so move on to step four, which okay. is to do collateral research. Um, I don't think we have a record for that, but basically you're saying if you don't find it for your direct ancestors, look up their research, their siblings, right? And they'll note, they might note more specifically than Ireland, correct? Correct. A um, couple examples of that. Um, one is a, a more direct link. A family I was researching for a client client had among its members a priest and normally you might think well i'm not going to research the priest because he never married or had children at least if he's a catholic priest um so there's no descendants to trace of him but in fact a lot of the, the priest records from the various dioceses and archdioceses are pretty thorough. At the very least, they may tell you uh, the parents' names, the siblings' names, including their sister's married names. So if you don't already know that, that'll give you a clue of where to look for more records relating to the family. Mm -hmm. um, there's also um, an example where and this was my own family. The there was a 
a child who died very young at about age 10. And he was one of 13 or 14 siblings. Wow. And back then you couldn't look stuff up for free. You had to pay for each lookup. <laughs> and, and as I'm tracking down all the relevant birth, marriages and deaths for me, because, you know, obviously he didn't have any survivor, any, you know, dependents that survived. But eventually, I think I could on the rest of that generation and still didn't have um, information. I thought I knew how, how the family connected. I had a, a uh, I knew who the parents were of this generation, but I didn't know who the parents' parents were. And I thought I had an idea, but I wasn't finding any proof of it. So eventually I broke down and I ordered a copy of the obituary for this little 10 year old boy. And it said, son of John Mary and grandson of oh. Connell and Mary. Yeah. And I thought, oh, there's proof that I thought it was Connell, but I couldn't prove that all, all these kids were Descended from Connell. Now, I know. You know, here's <laughs> in say an older sister file that tells me her file mentions where her parents came from, from an Ireland. Now you suddenly know where all of those children's parents came from in Ireland or whichever one might be came from. So it's always really good to go out as far as you can. For um, all of the children. Looking for those collateral pe people who may have a record that your person didn't. Exactly. Let's move on to step five, which is target locations in Ireland Oops. using the surname. So I'm going to show these two sites. Can you talk to us about what this means? And briefly, because our time is getting short. And we have some questions, some spe a specific question from the audience that I want to share. Sure. So um, talk okay. to us about um, these sites. If all else fails, then... Okay. If all else fails and you've searched high and low in every nook and cranny and you still don't have anything more specific than Ireland, if you at least have a, a name that isn't Mer Kelly or Kelly or any of the <laughs> other extremely common Irish names, there are, it is sometimes possible on a possibility of where they came from in Ireland because certain SEPs or clans came from certain areas and the name didn't really spread that widely. Um, so the first site has this is um, johngrenham.com slash surnames um, and that, that's the, um, the surname you're interested in so from the 1850s from the 1900s from the 1830s all over the place that you can and you can and it's on a map showing where that name is in each of these time periods uh, and so you'll probably find that um, Again, as long as you don't have a very common name, in if you're lucky, it knocks out all but maybe three most likely um, counties. Okay. So Claire, let's move on to step uh, one um, of the six. claims Claire. I did in preparation for this, just to give you some some idea is, I think it was. Claire, can you hear me? Claire? Okay. Well, yeah. the second step, the second site I just wanted to mention is the swilson.info. Claire, Claire, can you um, hear me? Site. 
Claire. His is based mostly on surnames in the 1901 and 1901 census. Yes. Thank you. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> we are short on time. I want did you to, get that? I'm sorry. I did. I'm sorry you that seem I'm to be not losing you. be yes. able to do the question live, but I'm going to share it with Claire and have her put it in the chat. I can hear you. <laughs> I just want to go ahead and give you the final steps, okay. which for finding your clues to your Irish past, which is step one, document what you know, locate U.S. records, locate church records, do collateral uh, okay. research, target locations in Ireland using the surname, and then you want to analyze and document your research. Guys, thank you so much. I'm sorry we ran out of time, but we do, we will answer your questions. Have a great day.